So the first and most basic question you need to ask yourself when doing educational analysis is what is the relationship between the everyday and the specialized? You do two things. Firstly, you work out what is the boundary strength between the everyday and the specialized. Is it solid? In other words, do you separate off the everyday and the specialized? Or is it open? Do you integrate the everyday and the specialized? Now, apart from that, you also have to think quite carefully about and develop tools which enable you to describe the move from the everyday to the specialized and what the specialized looks like in its own terms. Now, in this video, I'm going to cover both the boundary strength and what the nature of the specialized looks like in relation to the everyday. Let's quickly move through the boundary strength, seeing as though we did cover uh, quite a lot of this in the introductory video. The boundary strength can either be solid or open. By open, we're talking about a relationship where you separate off the everyday from the specialized, your local knowledge on the street, your everyday relationships are powerfully separated off from school knowledge and the specialized uh, knowledge that contains. On the other side, you have an open relationship between the everyday and specialized, where you integrate uh, local knowledge within specialized knowledge. Now, don't think at this stage that one of these is better than the other. These are analytical categories. At certain stages, it's good to separate. At other stages, it's good to integrate. That said, there have been very powerful arguments about whether the boundary should be open or solid. And the person who I suppose could be said to start, a, start off this debate was Plato, writing 2,400 years ago or so, uh, and he gives a foundational story, a, a metaphor about how education works, in which he argues for very strong boundaries between the everyday world on the one side and specialized knowledge on the other. Allow me to briefly tell you the story just so that I can illustrate the point. What he does is he, he imagines a situation where you have people who bound, tied up, chained uh, in a cave and all they can do is look forward to the cave wall and on the wall they see shadows. And because that's all they've ever seen, they take that to be the real world. Now for Plato, those shadows on the cave is our everyday experiences, our everyday symbols, our everyday understanding of living and dead things. Now what happens to one of the prisoners is suddenly someone comes from behind, uh, breaks their chains and pulls them upwards uh, rather reluctantly because they don't want to go, upwards and out of the cave. And as they move through the cave they begin to realize that the world they took to be real, this everyday world, is actually only an image and there's another complete world apart from that and this realization dawns when they enter the mouth of the cave and can look outwards. Now it's here that Plato shows how strong the line is between the everyday and the specialized. People cannot actually look out from the cave into this real world during the day. They have to look at night because otherwise they'd be blinded by the sun. They're not used to the difference. Crossing from one to the other is a very difficult experience. And only after they spent a lot of time accumulating or accustomizing uh, their eyes to the light are they able to contemplate this world outside the cave. Now that world for Plato is an abstract world. It's a specialized world. It's a world of mathematics. It's a world of abstract ideas. And it's the world of the principle of the good which informs everything, just as the sun warms the earth. Now, it's a wonderful story in all sorts of ways, but you can hear Plato pushing very strongly for a strong boundary between the cave of everyday experience and the light of uh, specialized abstraction. So Plato gives us a very powerful account as to why there should be a strong, solid line between the everyday and the specialized. It's not necessarily the way things should be, but there you have in the first account uh, the idea that the everyday should be separated from the specialized. Now when you do the move from the everyday world to the specialized, 
at a certain stage, especially at an early stage, you're actually caught between the two worlds. And I've tried to capture this as the centerpiece image to my own book, Cracking the Code to Educational Analysis. And what you'll see on the front cover is a pilgrim who is half caught within the everyday world, the world of buildings, the world of nature, the world of sun uh, and light and, and living and warmth. But he sees an equally beautiful world separated from it. And there he, he starts to see the music of symbols. He starts to see the music of abstraction. And he's working between those two worlds. Now what I want to try and show you is, is that the movement between the everyday and the specialized occurs in two very basic ways. Firstly, through the formalization of concepts, and secondly, through the way that you actually combine those concepts. And the person who gave a first account of how this works is Aristotle, Plato's greatest student. So between Plato and Aristotle, we actually have a really good first account of what the dynamics are of the relationship between the everyday and the specialized. Now, here is Aristotle trying to give an account of how to formalize concepts. Now, start down at the bottom with our species, uh, humans. Now, we've got two choices when asking what is a human being. The one is to give examples, to give instances, like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, uh, Wayne, Hugo, etc. Now, that works on a certain level, because you get to understand how we are human in terms of what we do and who we are. But there are enormous differences between these characters. What is it that makes us all human? Now, in order to do that, in order to generalize, in order to move beyond the local experiences of human being, Aristotle argued that what we can do is we can go from very general concepts and slowly but surely specify the concepts until we reached a point where we'd built up towards a definition of what a human being uh, is. So, for example, we start off with a very general concept like substance. Now, within substance, what uh, Aristotle would do is say you can have either a material substance or immaterial substance. Now, if you're working with material substance, well, then you're working with a body. Now, with bodies, bodies can either be animate or inanimate. If you're working with an animate body, well, then you're working with something that's living. A living creature could either be sensitive or insensitive. If you're working with a living, sensitive creature, well, then you're not with a man, you're with an animal. Maybe an animal is a man. Uh, and then within animals, the animals can either be rational or irrational. And what Aristotle says is that a human being is a rational animal that is a sensitive living creature that has an animate body and is a material substance. So you can see the way it works going from a very general concept all the way to more specific concepts which build logically on each other until you get to the definition of a human being. And in this you begin to see the beginnings of how to formalize concepts within education. Now, Aristotle didn't stop there. He also showed us how to formalize logic, how to formalize the connection between things. It's an astonishing achievement to actually see what this man did. And it's, you know, there's reasons why Aristotle and Plato compete for who sits at the fountainhead of Western philosophy. Because certainly for large periods of time, uh, Aristotle... Uh, formed the major influence. And in his logic, what he did was he gave some very clear definitions of how connections work. And here we have four of them. Either all of A is in B, or no A is B, or some A is B, or some A is not B. Now, if any of you do programming, you'll recognize that these are some of the very basic logical connections uh, programmers make when working um, with programming. But the reason why I'm trying to show you these uh, situations is it's through the formalization of concept and through the formalization of connections that we have the shift from the everyday to the specialized.